Okay, good morning, everybody. And can uh, somebody confirm that you can indeed hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Public Procurement in Times of Crisis and Beyond, Resilience Through Sustainability. First, a few practical details for today's webinar. Uh, the, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Electronic Swatch website after the webinar today. Everybody is on mute. And as usual, if you have technical issues, please try to use the Q&A or the chat function and Martina will do her best to help you out. Uh, this time, to help all of you contribute ideas and raise questions as we go along, we have added an idea board. And you see the URL for the idea board at the bottom of the screen. So the idea here <clears throat> is that you type in this URL, tinyurl.com slash eWatch2021 into another window. And then you can add your ideas, your comments, and your questions to the present to, <clears throat> to in response to what you hear today as we go along. And at the very end, we will look at them and we can discuss them. Um, so again, tinyurl.com slash eWatch2021. Uh, this uh, URL will be repeated on other slides as well in case you missed it right now. So Electronics Watch helps public sector organizations work together and collaborate with civil society monitors in production regions to protect the rights of workers in their electronic supply chains. The idea for this webinar came from a question from an affiliate to Electronics Watch. And the question was this, public buyers are under pressure to cut costs at the best of times. And right now, the pressure is even higher to do so. Just like the aftermath of the global financial crisis, I worry responsible procurement will lose its focus and its priority ranking. How can public buyers support workers while showing to our paymasters that we are not losing focus of value for money too? So this question clearly struck a chord with affiliates to Electronics Watch. And we believe that the answer is that value for money goes hand in hand with the resilient supply chains which in turn depends on support for basic worker rights and sustainable production practices. So public procurement is under pressure to cut cost and increase efficiency, but this need not be and should not be in contradiction to sustainable and socially responsible public procurement. But how do we strengthen social and environmental responsibility in public procurement during crisis and beyond? So for answers, <clears throat> we turn now to no less than 12 presenters in today's webinar. The first three presenters that you will hear are experienced monitors and social auditors in the electronics industry. The final nine are public procurement practitioners and experts. And altogether, they come from nine countries, so we get, a, so we get diverse perspectives. This is the way it's going to work. We have asked each presenters to discuss one idea only within five minutes. And they each have one slide only to present their, their idea. And we'll go like this. I will present each speaker very briefly. After four minutes, I will unmute myself and ask the speaker to finish in one minute. And at five minutes, we'll go on to the next speaker. Then after all speakers have presented, we will look at the connecting themes and see if we can put it all together. Finally, we have Q&A and we will look at the comments and questions that you have placed on the idea board. Again, the URL is at the bottom of this screen. And with this, and I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself at the beginning also when I welcomed you. My name is Bjorn Claus and I'm director of Electronics Watch. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, and with this, um, now we're, we're going on to the first presenter. Dimitri Kessler, who's a founder and director of the Economic Rights Institute in Hong Kong. Dimitri, over to you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the slide, yes. So if there was a simple, can everyone hear me? 
I believe I have unmuted myself. Yes? Yes. Okay. So uh, if I were to kind of really condense my thought for this discussion, it's that I hope that we don't get distracted by the COVID crisis. And uh, let me begin with that. I fully recognize that the COVID crisis has provoked a number of very specific crises for workers that go beyond even the question of, of health, of whether or not you've become infected with uh, COVID. That includes uh, flexible employment has always kind of uh, left certain workers extremely vulnerable. Many of these workers were out of a job technically uh, during the infection and that's left them out of the loop for a lot of the sort of protections that would normally be connected to full-time employment. There's a lot of prejudice happening over the risk of infection. So in China, we're now seeing quite commonly uh, companies that are just refusing to hire anyone from Hubei, the province where the infections first began. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty and disruption, both uh, in terms of the business side, but also in terms of the recruitment of workers. And because companies find uh, recruitment <coughs> difficulty uh, and they they're, have less flexibility to cope with uh, sort of what's happening with on the business side, many companies that previously were more progressive on these issues are now resorting to coercion to keep workers in their jobs even when they might otherwise prefer to leave. Um, and then of course, with the quarantines, the government is relying on companies to, to monitor uh, for the risk of infection, to enforce quarantines sometimes. And that's certainly adding uh, tension and hostilities in the workplace. And then of course, I think we can see that the uh, COVID crisis is, is prompting a number of different shifts in the wider political atmosphere. That includes kind of the intensification of the rhetoric from Trump in the United States and the impact that has with companies considering uh, divesting from China. But it also includes the Chinese government now monitoring Chinese citizens' movements through their telephones in a way that is unprecedented and has real impact on workers' rights monitoring, workers mobilizing, and this thing. So there are very specific risks to COVID that are worth our attention. And it's also true that crises give a sense of urgency that can motivate us. At the same time, uh, this crisis uh, with COVID is not even over, and we're already seeing renewed attention on the very serious issue of forced employment of Uyghurs in China. Um, there's still a number of ongoing crises or older crises that were never resolved. And to be able to effectively intervene to help workers to reduce the risk of the next crisis, or even just to kind of soothe some of the wounds of the current crisis, we need systems for intervention. And that's where I really think we need to focus our energies in thinking about how we can influence the industry constructively and effectively. And to do that, I would, I'm just raising here four questions, but I think we can really think about what is monitoring? Uh, how credible is our monitoring? Because we know that much of the industry depends on audits that frequently come to no findings when there's other methodologies that can show that that's just patently misleading. Uh, we need a wider sense of the industry also because we need to make comparisons. We can't solve everything and we can't just focus on the most obvious companies. We need to be trying to identify the worst performers and the best performers and trying to incentivize better performance and, and hold the worst performers accountable. We need to consider the risks because it's just not true that we can act on everything. We need a sense of our priorities and one we need minute, to consider one minute. Thank you. Yeah. And we need to consider how we can intervene, whether that's going to be costly uh, and, and therefore sustainable and how effective it's going to be and how we include a consideration for those costs in our pricing. And then uh, finally, that's jumping the slide a little early now. I need to go back to my own. Um, yes, and we need to think about how to um, uh, use our influence to structure it better. And obviously, sort of bigger orders get more attention. It's not necessary that we need to 
combine all orders together. But if we think about the timing of orders, if we think about <coughs> framework agreements, if we think about how we're engaging in dialogue with suppliers and the brands and ultimately the factories, we need to be thinking consciously about how to strategize in order to have effective influence. And that's something that's independent of any particular crisis. And I'll end <coughs> there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dimitri, for doing this on time. And I apologize for mistakenly forwarding slides uh, too early. <laughs> um, let's not get distracted by, this, uh, by the COVID-19 crisis. Recognize the impact it does have on workers while we build systems, real systems intervention. Thank you very much. Now we go on to the next, next speaker, see if I can forward a slide. So <clears throat> uh, this speaker is, uh, uh, I want to welcome Aikut Kazanji. He's a senior supply chain specialist in China. Aikut, can you hear us and can we hear you? Uh, yes, I can. I'm, I'm afraid my sound is not very clear, but I will do my best to be close to the screen. Is that okay? It sounds good. Thank you. Good. Um, so we will, we will focus on the monitoring part of the supply chain responsibility. Um, because it is uh, one of the very active tools we regularly use, but we're not passing to regular times. Uh, these are the extraordinary times. And so there are two overarching questions, whether uh, we should monitor, continue monitoring or not. And, and the next one is how, which might take quite long to answer, but uh, in, a, in a quick nutshell, um, what we used to say for training I think is equally true for monitoring today. We used to say, if business is good, uh, if there are good times, give some money for training, allocate some budget for it. And when the business is not good, just double it. So um, I think it's true for monitoring too. Uh, there are many reasons for that, but in a, in a quick answer, there are um, certain issues which are actually known for a long time in the supply chain, but they're actually um, uh, multiplying. And I picked uh, especially three of them. One is uh, we are hearing more and more that wages for workers are unfairly reduced or delayed, uh, whether this is reasonable, understandable, legal, mutually agreed or not, of course, is a, is a huge question. Uh, the next one is um, some employees, some factories are forcing employees to stay in work 24-7 when they are quarantined due to COVID outbreaks, which we, we are hearing in Turkey and some other countries. Uh, again, whether this is legal, mutually agreed or not, is, um, is only can be answered by monitoring. And uh, another interesting and, and quite concerning issue that we are constantly hearing in the auditor's world is buyers themselves, the retailers, buying houses, brands, and so on, are unreasonably extending the payment terms to, to suppliers in the supply chain, which is, of course, not directly related to workers' rights, but it is uh, definitely directly impacting their livelihoods. Uh, so, so, so responsible organizations like us and buyers and public procurers need to monitor um, uh, factories more and more these days <coughs> to understand the extent of these issues. And of course, on top of these, adds to um, COVID-related preventive measures, which, are, uh, which might be ignored. Uh, distancing in the factories may need um, quite a comprehensive layout, restructuring. Personal protection equipment needs uh, better, proper, renewed equipment. And think about hygiene needs in the factories, where in most factories, we normally monitor in the normal times we hardly ever find soaps and, and let alone we need uh, sufficient soap and disinfectants in the, in the workplace today. So these all means monitoring and training. Um, but of course, the big question is how can we monitor factories in, the, in, the, in the today's world? Uh, well, um, uh, there are certain ways. Some companies temporarily stop monitoring, which is of course uh, trivial and quite concerning. Uh, some factories, rely, uh, some buyers are relying on uh, self-assessment from factories, but uh, many buyers and brands um, are also using uh, what we can uh, call an online auditing today and in different forms. There are snapshot online auditing, which are still uh, not, of course, serving the purpose, um, like having a quick chat with the factory managers, like a Zoom meeting. 
but we are also hearing there are uh, quite um, uh, reasonably conducted extended audits uh, and monitoring activities by online tools using, uh, for example, a walkthrough uh, person in the factory to see the, the you know, measures online, um, taking some of the uh, workers' uh, contact lists and, and interviewing workers even remotely by One phone minute. on a Sunday. One minute. Sorry okay, thank you. I'm, I'm just wrapping up. Uh, thank you, Bjorn. Um, uh, and of course, uh, we can do a risk assessment today where we should focus. We are hearing that in, for example, countries like China and Vietnam, it is possible to still physically uh, monitor the factories by local teams, but this is not possible in many countries. And also, even if it is possible, it is dangerous. So we need to find a, a kind of combination of monitoring by using several available tools uh, in the market. And I think um, I will stop at this point. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Aykut, uh, raising very interesting questions about alternative tools to uh, conduct monitoring that are sorely needed still, uh, and especially needed perhaps during this time of crisis. Um, as you'll see, we only have germs of ideas here, and uh, I'm sure that all presenters will be more than happy to get back to you to explain further about their ideas. So going on to the next presenter, uh, we have now Ha Kim, who is managing, managing Director for the Center for Development and Integration, CDI, in Vietnam. Ha, can you hear us and can we hear you? <clears throat> Thank you, Bion. Great. So um, the one idea from CDI is very simple, it's the transparency. Um, and actually, uh, from our perspective, uh, as a liberal organization from uh, production countries, we think that transparency is a key point, a starting point for every action for, to be follow up. And the transparency is to be from top level, from policy commitments to the real actions, not just lip service from the manager of PR and marketing uh, campaigns. Um, and uh, from our perspective, um, the transparency uh, is really important, especially for the brands and factories. Um, it's not um, a new thing. Actually, COVID-19 is only a push to show that we need to make it better and make it more transparent uh, throughout the supply chains. And from our own experience in getting information and data and trying to get in touch with the brands and factory, we found out that information and transparency is really important. And, and the, we hope that brands and factories uh, will be more active in publishing on information related to their commitments and reaction uh, related to the business and human rights. Um, I know that very big company, they have already have a nice and beautiful policy public on the website, but that is somehow the theories. And we need to have more concrete uh, information how they turn it into action in the real life. Um, for example, this is sustainability reports. Um, we need more detailed information, especially for each country, factories, um, and any violation or risks um, that they have found out and how they will follow up with the uh, improvement plans. Also, we look forward to have the list of suppliers and buyers in the country for the brands so that we can contact um, when it required um, uh, to discard the risks of violations. And finally, we think that the transparency should include also the openness and the trust from all stakeholders to have more constructive dialogue. Only when we are open, then the dialogue can begin. And finally, I think um, it is the consumer, the buyer who bear the cost, and it is the worker who bear the loss during the crisis. So um, without really the transparency and really commit the real commitment from own stakeholder, we cannot improve anything. Um, and the crisis uh, give us a chance to to dialogue and, and improve the things. Um, but this should come from the transparency at an entry point. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, um, to for your very uh, concise presentation. 
uh, COVID-19 crisis really highlights the need for more transparency for companies to uh, turn their commitments policy into action and show how to do it. And, it's, and the crisis is also a chance for, for dialogue among, among stakeholders. Thank you so much. And uh, we now move on to uh, the next speaker. Um, merci. Correcha Torrens, who is the Director General of the Public Procurement for Public Procurement of the Government of Catalonia in Spain. Um, merci, can, uh, welcome, and, um, and can you hear us, and can we hear you? Yes, I can hear you. And Fantastic. Thank you very much, Bjorn. Good morning, everybody. Thank you to Electronics Watch for inviting me to this webinar. I will focus on how public procurement can be an opportunity to get over the economic crisis. COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted some of the weaknesses of public procurement in Catalonia and Spain as well. Like a mirror put in front of us, we have seen all the worst of our system, like the excessive length of proceedings, the dependence of farm markets, and the bureaucratic burdens as the principal obstacles. On the contrary, we are strong in social and green public procurement, and we have a lot of SMEs which are able to innovate and to bring knowledge and value to public procurement. I am proud to say that, for example, <clears throat> that for example, in 2018, seven out of 10 euros spent by the Catalan government in public procurement included social clauses, while in 2016, they were only four out of 10 euros. We have increased also the green clauses from two out of 10 euros in 2016 to four out of 10 euros in 2018. An intensive action has been performed in the last three years by improving codes, uh, improving codes, guides, and models. As the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown have hit hard local and small companies and has destroyed a lot of jobs as well, innovation procurement and social and green public procurement can offer a lot of opportunities to get over the crisis. We are working now to improve uh, our public procurement through a Catalan public procurement strategy, which is a plan to have a more transparent, digital, smart, and efficient public procurement. It will have about 25, 30 measures to be developed during the next four years. Some of the measures included in the plan are, for example, the creation of a new platform to increase the collaboration between public administrations and private companies and entities. Another measure is the promotion of new social and green clauses adapted to the new situation. For example, to score or to impose as an obligation during the performance of a contract, the hiring of unemployed people or stable hiring or with uh, better working conditions. Some examples of green clauses are, uh, can be to score the use of alternative energies to promote energy efficiency in public buildings to score the inclusion of organic food in meals, in contracts of schools or hospitals, or the reduction of the carbon footprint in contracts like cleaning or security and others. At the same time, I want to mention that the Catalan government is launching 20 projects in the framework of an economic recovery plan approved in July, which is based in three axles to reduce social inequalities increased by COVID-19, to accelerate the transition to a more sustainable and resilient economic model, and to strengthen the capacity of the health and social health system. The total amount of the plan is about uh, 31,765 million euros. That's a lot of money. And they have long-term projects and short-term projects as well. One project I want to mention is the digital transformation of the education sector. Launched one minute, please, Merci, one minute. Okay, about 24 million in 2020 and 160 million in the period 2021, 2025. 
In this project, for example, uh, we are going to buy computers for all teachers and students, about 300,000 computers for all the schools, and the installation of a quality LAN Wi-Fi in 1,230 schools. So there are a lot of projects also in climate action, circular economy, housing, and sustainable, sustainable mobility, and energy efficiency as well. I think uh, most of the projects will use public procurement as a tool, and I hope they will have and they will create a lot of opportunities for local companies, for SMEs, and for big companies as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Merci, for this uh, hopeful message. I think public procurement does a powerful tool to get us out of economic crisis if we use uh, social clauses uh, as uh, Catalonia it has, is increasing over the um, last four or five years. So thank you very much for this. Um, next speaker uh, is uh, Stéphane Bollet, uh, public policies manager at UGAP in, Fr in France. Um, St Stéphane, can you hear us? Uh, yes, and I'm ready. Perfect, thank you. So I go on? Yes, we can hear you fine, thank you. So hello everybody. Um, the activity of UGAP is to buy by public procurement to private sector to some product and services. And after we sell this product services to public sector with a vendor. So the rest of our supplier is crucial for us. So the idea, we want to share is to send link and mutual knowledge between us, all suppliers, their subcontractors. Why is it important? During the COVID crisis, of course, we took care of the health of our suppliers. It is very important in finance. We decide with, with each of them to go on or to stop the contract, uh, for instance, to stop the order from our customer the idea was to not generate delay penalties. Uh, it, it would um, put our suppliers in difficulty if we go on when a supplier is not able to deliver the product. So we have to adapt each situation to the situation of our suppliers. We are used to take care of the suppliers and especially the enemy. It's in our DNA. We have some quiet results in this field. Uh, the half of our suppliers are SME. We pay in less than 30 days. We have a enemy barometer, for instance. So we consider that have some value uh, which have uh, impact on our behavior. And we consider that this behavior help us to be stronger. And for instance, our turnover went on to increase during crisis. And we are convinced that the behavior in direction of SL and suppliers is a reason of our uh, turnover, which, has, which had uh, to increase during crisis. So we had two ideas, sorry. The first one um, was to share our behavior with our suppliers. The, our suppliers know our method to work, but we are not sure they, they know our value, our vision, our philosophy. And we decided to share with them in order they have the good behavior self with their subcontractors because we want that the whole supply chain will be stronger um, with the help of behavior between the stakeholders. So the first thing we did, um, we create a webinar program in order to share these values um, or public policies or vision, the way to business uh, uh, responsible and not only business for this. And we share all this journey as we record the webinar, of course, we are able to share with new suppliers uh, this vision in order to help them to be stronger. And as I said, it could help them to be, uh, to have a better behavior with their own subcontractors and suppliers. And in this way, we realized that we weren't sure to know exactly what are the relationship between our suppliers and the subcontractor and their subcontractor? We are not sure to know all the subcontractors. We are not sure to know 
if they are well paid, uh, if they know at least the content of our contact with the supplies. And, and it's important, if I go, we saw it during the COVID crisis. If a supporter fails, um, we fail too. Is a part of the supply chain, like us. So we decided to investigate. We create some questions in direction of suppliers, in direction of the subcontractors, now, and in direction of our own buyers. The goal is to know the relationship between the suppliers and the subcontractors. And today we ask about the question from the contract we have already seen. One but minute, please. One minute. We will investigate um, this question during the tender in order to know what is the quality of this relationship. And after tomorrow, we'll certainly integrate in more evaluation in the selection, this quality of relationship. Because for instance, you can say that a BCP or a BRP of a subcontractor is important for the quality of service you, you are buying. So we hope, certainly in several years, that at the end, the quality of this relationship could be integrated of the selection method of the offer during a tender. I have finished, so I thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Stefan, for this uh, important message of communication, collaboration, knowledge sharing among public buyers, suppliers, and subcontractors on many different levels. We're all connected. And uh, what happens on one level impacts what happens on another level. So thank you so much for this. Uh, we go on to, um, to another continent, uh, to Australia, Steve Johnston, who is Director of Strategic Procurement at the Council of Australasian University Directors of Information Technology. Steve, are you there and can you hear us? I am here. Fantastic. And yes, I, yes, I can hear you. That's great. Okay. Uh, so Cordit's been around uh, for a couple of decades now. We've been working since uh, the early 1990s and we've been largely involved in collaborative work across the higher education sector in Australia. And we've done a lot of work um, as a group and we've discovered that by working together we're able to significantly uh, change both our expenditure patterns and the activities that are undertaken by our vendors. The key driver is a reduction duplication. So all of the universities in Australia and New Zealand, uh, which are our key constituents, have very similar requirements. And by aligning those requirements and making sure that they're addressed uh, together, we're able to achieve a number of things. The first thing we're able to do, obviously, is we're able to generate savings. We're able to drive down pricing uh, for a number of reasons. We make things easier for vendors to provide services to the sector uh, and we align those services across all of our independent businesses. Uh, and the expenditure we've got within IT just in those that university sector is about 2.8 billion Australian dollars per year. So it's not a insignificant amount of expenditure. A lot of that does go on staffing and resourcing but much of it goes to vendor purchasing and much of that goes to uh, collaborative purchasing that is done on behalf of the sector. What it does is it gives us the ability to not just drive down price, but it also gives us the ability to shift the goals of the particular vendors that we're working with and to change their approach as we change ours. So as a group of universities, and we've got about 63 members of Cordit, if we all start asking for the same terms, conditions, and requirements around modern slavery, we're going to be able to have an impact upon the, the vendors that we work with that is significantly greater than the individual universities working alone. Uh, we're backed up in Australia by the Modern Slavery Act that was introduced in 2018 and is in the process of being um, rolled out across all of the universities. I think the first reporting date is in early 2021. But there's a lot of effort being put into that right now. And during this crisis, it's really an opportune moment to take stock, to look at the various demands and the various requirements of the universities, to align them together and to work, not just to generate savings, but to also generate changing behaviour from our vendors 
and to make sure that those behaviours meet our common goals and common demands. Now, we've achieved over the last 20 years or so significant financial savings, um, and we're hoping that those savings haven't had come at the cost of social uh, issues in the countries that have been supplying us for the, for the last period of time. Um, there's some evidence that we certainly could have done this better uh, and we're taking the approach that from here on we'll obviously be tracking these things significantly more closely. Uh, in 2021, Corded is setting up a panel, um, a working group that will be working and looking at due diligence requirements across all of our vendor relationships. Modern slavery is but part of that. There are protections around privacy, uh, corporate social responsibility, uh, combined planning and com combined demand to ensure that we're not duplicating the services that we've got and the services we operate. One minute, please, Steve, one minute. Thank you. And to effectively tidy up uh, what we've been doing. And so my key message is around collaboration. By working together, we're able to drive these things significantly faster than they would otherwise be driven and to ensure that our vendors have the focus that we would like them to have on reducing uh, modern slavery as a concern. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve, and thank you also for this um, important message that collaboration and uh, actually works. You drive down price and you achieve social goals, collaboration among public buyers in this case. So thank you so much for this. Um, we go on to the next speaker. Um, <clears throat> and I asked Albert right before the presentation about the pronunciation of his last name, and now, I, now it's slipped through my head a little bit. But uh, Albert Chokris, who is Contract Category Manager, Data Centers at the Ministry of Education, Culture and Science in the Netherlands. Albert, thank you uh, and uh, welcome. You can hear us. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name is uh, Albert Geugies. Uh, Bjorn pronounces very well. Um, well, uh, today I have this opportunity uh, to tell uh, something about uh, the Dutch government and um, how we uh, address the sustainability and the resilient supply chain uh, issue, uh, which is all about this 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 webinar. Uh, first, uh, before I get to the to the slide, I will uh, uh, tell something about the Dutch government. Uh, we, we have set uh, long-term goals on, on uh, uh, sustainability and, and it is anchored in, in policy. And the policy is called uh, purchasing with impact. And for every uh, purchasing, uh, for example, paper or ICT hardware or food, uh, there are uh, goals set uh, which is obligatory when you uh, place a tender in the market, it has to contain uh, those uh, uh, things where we can uh, uh, provide impact in the market. Well, that, that, that's the, the, the starting point. And um, uh, we don't see any budget cost already. Uh, we, we think as, as responsible for data center hardware, which uh, uh, we, we are talking about server, storage, networking, that kind of uh, uh, appliances um, and hardware. Uh, we, we see an increase of, of spend on, on those things. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, in 2016, uh, the category data center, which is responsible for all data center hardware for the Dutch government, uh, has already started with a focus on social conditions. And, and we're um, uh, continuing uh, our focus on social conditions with the new policy uh, purchasing with impact. And we have built a strategy uh, around that. And, and we were just intensifying our effort in sustainable uh, uh, supply chain with focus on uh, mandatory application in tenders of clauses contain sustainability and social 
clauses. We have a strong focus on contract management, but you, you can put a lot of things in your tenders, but if you don't uh, follow up in a contract management uh, uh, phase, you uh, miss a, a, a big statement. And uh, we are working towards a so-called price sustainable ratio in our uh, mini tenders. Uh, and uh, we are setting up supply, uh, uh, supplier management. We, we have uh, uh, discussions with our main vendors and uh, we get input from Electronics Watch and we have also input from uh, another independent monitoring uh, organization called Ecovadis. With those two uh, uh, inputs, we have this supply chain, uh, supplier management talks on uh, uh, enhancing and, and, and uh, get more insight in the supply chain and how can we uh, make it better. And uh, what we've seen the last few years, and that's where my slide is about, there is no su sustainable solution without sustainable demand. And uh, we, we see our, our budget holders uh, never ask a sustainable question. They are ought to do because it's policy of the Dutch government, but they find it very difficult. And uh, one minute, please, Albert. We, we uh, uh, had a recent uh, uh, discussion and we, we uh, uh, helped them to create an innovative, sustainable demand. You have to work with the market, with the suppliers, and uh, you have to be a director in the supply chain. And uh, for at least we not as a, as a purchasing department has to uh, start a sustainable program, but the demand side, and we help them with that. Well, thank you for my uh, uh, time. And uh, that was my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Albert. Um... Uh, and for sharing the experience of the, of the Dutch government, emphasizing uh, the importance of contract management and independent monitoring and creating sustainable demand, working with the market to, uh, to, to, to get purchasing with impact, a simple and powerful phrase, purchasing with impact. Thank you. We go on to the next one. Next presenter, uh, Carla Canal Rosic. Uh, International Relations Officer at the Barcelona City Council in, in Spain. Carla, welcome. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. So, uh, well, uh, I work also in policy coherence uh, for development and in, in public um, procurement. So, um, I choose also uh, trans to talk about transparency, as two of our colleagues already did, no? ha uh, Hakim and Stefan Bove also talk somehow about transparency um, because I, okay, let me just see my presentation, I have made some changes, um, because, well, um, um, I think we choose this because it, it, it is a requirement to be able to work on many other topics and because um, maybe we already knew the existing existing deficits, but COVID crisis or, or any other crisis uh, brings it brings the importance of transparency in, into light. No, why? Well, what I, I'm going to talk about mandatory transparency of the whole supply chain. That means from mineral extraction to final disposal of waste. Um, why not what I said, because it's it's uh, a requirement for due diligence uh, and it is also a requirement to create a sustainable change that can face a crisis and then can provide rights to all the people, all the people on the earth. So um, and who the, the transparency is um, the requirement of transfer it's for companies, of course, but also public buyers because uh, public buyers also are in the chain. So we also have to um, to require to demand this transparency. We, we, ha we have to be able to say what are we buying and what are we. So um, I, I just wanted to focus because that's what we are working on in uh, Barcelona City Council 
it's uh, where can you ask this transparency? Um, Hakim uh, uh, spoke about uh, many other places where you can ask transparency, but um, I wanted to focus in the procurement law. So uh, transparency can and should be dem demand to all companies uh, without any legal problems for, for the public buyers, I mean, uh, within the procurement law. And, um, and as Hakim said, not only within the procurement law. So now, we sh why, uh, now from now, we, we should be asking for this transparency. And sometimes we are not doing it. So we are not doing our job. And we, how and where we can ask it in the tenders and in the contract. Uh, we can ask, for example, in, partic in uh, particular conditions, as Electronics Watch uh, does, but also in other places, not in the subject matter of the of the contract, in the selection criteria, in the technical specifications, in and in the award criteria. But as uh, we are working with Electronics Watch and with many other um, subjects. We see that when you put um, requ requirements in contract conditions, that means that, that it, it is applied to anybody that will um, that will have the tender will have these conditions. Um, companies cannot ask you to cannot say that this is uh, too much or that this is not fair or they, they cannot go against this requirement of transparency because it, it is something that it that you, you will ask any company so um, one minute please great so yeah just to finish uh, of course it's for every company in every tender and also in the web that as our colleague said and also like to know each other and after th there are there are some uh, of course there are other fields related no so after you, you have to ask for transparency but after you have to develop mechanism for follow up and, and for control no so and this is the, why is it useful to uh, work in network or to do aggregate uh, purchases and yeah, and also that this that public buyers have to demand business uh, partners with capacity to assess human rights supply chain risks, so transparency, and also provide remedies. And this is also another subject that I'm not going to talk. So yeah, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, underline the, the importance of, of transparency and that as uh, public buyers, in, at least in, in Europe and also in other countries, we can we can ask it already now from now and we are allowed and we should be asking more transparency thank you thank you very much carla for highlighting this critical theme of transparency necessary to drive sustainable change i thought it was interesting to emphasize that both companies and public buyers need to be transparent and have different transparency requirements and that uh, we create an even playing field for all companies by making it mandatory in tenders Thank you so much. And we go on to the next speaker, Farid Amir, who is public sector lead for the Modern Slavery Unit at the Home Office in the UK. Farid, are you there and can you hear us? Yeah, thank you, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Um, I wanted to present on the purpose of transparency and why we in the UK are so obsessed with it. Uh, but also uh, why as central government we've started to walk the walk and become more transparent about the risks of forced labour in our own supply chains. Um, so in 2015 we introduced the Modern Slavery Act which made us the first country in the world uh, to require businesses to publish annual modern slavery statements and be transparent about how they are tackling modern slavery in their operations and supply chain. I know California already had uh, such legislation but it's not a country so Technically, we get that title of being the first country in the world. Um, the transparency provision in the Modern Slavery Act was designed to create internal and external drivers for businesses to take action and invest more resources into due diligence in their supply chains. So the internal drivers uh, built, were built in because you know statements require board approval and director level sign off, which creates that senior leadership accountability for how those uh, companies are tackling on slavery. 
And then there's also, you know, the external drivers. So these statements are publicly available. So NGOs, media, consumers, investors, and others can scrutinize a business's performance. And whenever you place some sort of reporting regulation on business, uh, you're pretty likely to start having stakeholders turn around and ask government why we aren't reporting in the same way. And so in the context of modern slavery reporting, uh, it's an issue that, that, you know, obviously affects almost every sector and every country in the world. And as central government, we spend a lot of money on um, procurement. We spend about fifty billion pounds a year in central government, and an additional two hundred billion in the wider public sector. Uh, we're bound to have risks of forced labour, modern slavery, labour exploitation, whatever you want to call it, um, uh, in our supply chains. So we agreed with stakeholders on this occasion and said, "Yeah, we, sh we should be reporting ourselves." So we put advice in twenty eighteen to the former prime minister recommending that she announced uh, our intention to publish the government's first modern slavery statement. And she did so at the uh, G20 in a massive um, international event. Um, and this gave us a lot of internal buy-in to accelerate our efforts. Um, we created a cross-government working group that ensures 20 departments across government were engaged and participating in our efforts. Uh, we published guidance that sets out the steps departments should be publishing should be taking throughout the uh, commercial life cycle to tackle modern slavery. Uh, we ran training on how to apply the guidance to over 250 commercial and procurement staff across government. Um, we also launched the modern slavery assessment tool, which is freely available to any public sector organisation in the UK, and allows them to identify and manage modern slavery risks with their suppliers. Um, you know, across central government, we worked with, uh, we directly worked with over 400 suppliers uh, through this tool. Um, we announced plans to evaluate social value criteria in all major procurements. One of our departments even started a project with um, Electronics Watch. Um, and in total, we worked with over 100 officials in, in central government to develop the government on slavery st statement and report on all this sort of activity that we'd undertaken. And we did this all in just over one year. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind that the commitment to publish a transparency statement played a massive role in getting all of government to do so much work in one year um, to put us in a, in a good position to, to report on our efforts. Um, knowing that our work will be scrutinized by the most senior people in government, including the prime minister and external stakeholders uh, helped us get the resources and attention we needed internally to do this work. Um, so we published the statement in March uh, this year. One um, minute, please. Thanks, Bron. Um, you can you can find the statement by searching UK government on slavery statement, and it includes a personal forward from the Prime Minister. Um, the statement makes it clear that we are just at the beginning of our journey, and despite all the progress we made in that one year, uh, there's still such a long way to go. Um, in the statement, we committed ourselves to 13 goals to help us make those steps um, and ministerial departments will be publishing individual statements starting next year um, and they can provide more granularity on, on uh, what they're doing compared to us publishing it for all of government. Um, we've also launched a consultation on strengthening the Modern Slavery Act, including bringing public bodies such as local authorities, police forces and others in scope for the requirement. Uh, we'll publish our response to the consultation very, very soon. So I can't say exactly what will be in it, uh, but if you look at the consultation and the measures that we've, we've consulted on, you can tell that we are definitely keen for there to be more transparency in the private and public sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Farid, uh, and for uh, reporting on the exciting work at the of the UK government. I think it's probably fair to say that the Transparency, transparency provision in the Modern Slavery Act has been and continues to be a critical driver of transparency uh, globally in many supply chains. And uh, also thank you for recognizing that if government, if, if government is requiring companies to report and to be transparent, government should itself walk the talk and be transparent and report on what, uh, what they're doing themselves as, as the Home Office has started to do. So thank you so much for this. We go on to the next presenter, Kathleen McCoy, who is a manager of sustainable supply chains of the Stockholm region in Sweden. Kathleen, welcome, and can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Good. And my presentation, great. 
know your supply chain. Carla, I'm afraid I'm, I might be repeating some of what you said, but hopefully I'll have some new points to make. Uh, know your supply chain. For anyone who's worked with the bank sector, this may remind you of KYC, which is know your customer, which is about taking measures to fight money laundering. So that was my inspiration. So it's kind of basic when you think about it to know your supply chains, um, but it proves challenging in practice, especially for big uh, procuring uh, authorities such as ourselves. Uh, so for us as a public authority to require that our suppliers know their supply chain and are transparent about it with us is something that we've been actively working on for a couple of years. And it became very obvious this spring that this is, is even more important in times of crisis. Our suppliers are often resellers, so they wouldn't be the big brands. And sometimes we've discovered that they don't have this information, they haven't bothered to gather this information, they can have a, an agent, for example, in another European country. And so there's layers between them and, and the producing, uh, the manufacturers, for example. Um, and I think it's, it's fair to draw the conclusion that if they don't even know the supply chain, then they cannot possibly be working to mitigate the risks in the supply chain either. So they're by definition not fulfilling uh, their contractual obligations. So Carla was into this. I think it's a good idea to include in your contracts, uh, at least that when the contracts enter into force, you will want to know the address of the major final assemblies and perhaps even choose some of the high risk components manufacturers uh, and that you get this information during the time of the contract. And Electronics Watch has such clauses. So if you need concrete examples of what that could look like, uh, you can get that. Um, for us, we've even thought that there is an added value of working with suppliers that know their supply chains. And so uh, sometimes we've verified this already at uh, the bidding stage. So we've either had it as a mandatory requirement that they verify at bidding, not in IT, I have to admit, but in medical equipment, um, but also as an award criteria. So we've said we're willing to pay more for bidders who actually can show to us at, at the time of, of handing in their tender that they have the structures in place, they will be able to perform their contract and to give us this information because they're already working in this manner. Um, there's a challenge here. Our suppliers, especially in the IT industry or ICT, have informed us that the supply chains are dynamic, which would mean that the information we get at bidding or during the contract period may change. And the question here is how much information can we administer? So it's not just about asking for lots of information. You've got to be able to do something with it. And even just, I mean, if you think about the amount of things we procure, um, I think you have to think about how much information can you handle, what can you actually do with it. Um, but I think those are details that can be can be worked out. The main principle is uh, some kind of obligation on your suppliers that then map the supply chain. Um, we can also take a step more and not just map what factories, but what are the risks? How do they work to monitor uh, these factories in the supply chain? So like I said, these are things we've been working on, but in times of crisis, monitoring has become extremely challenging. Uh, other speakers have already mentioned that audits are not taking place. They haven't during the, the spring. Uh, very few are taking place right now. Um, and at the same time, we know that the risks are increasing. Uh, it could be due to high demand. You've closed down, you're reopening. Uh, One so, minute, please. Yes. Uh, risks of excessive overtime are probably higher now than they've ever been, not to mention the risks of um, health and living, you know, working, confined working conditions and confined living conditions. So the health risks to the workers. Uh, so the risks are increasing, all monitoring capacities are decreasing. And that's why it's extra important to have suppliers with knowledge of the risks, established relationships down the supply chain. And sometimes we do get reports directly from monitoring partners or human rights activists on the ground. And then we need to have suppliers who can work with us uh, down the supply chain to address uh, what we discover is going on on the ground. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Kathleen. And uh, thank you for this parallel between um, the financial world and the public procurement, uh, where it's just as important for the public buyers to know their suppliers as it is for uh, financial managers, banks to know their customers. And, um, you know, and as you say, um, you know, how can you mitigate the risk? How can you be, um, prevent risk if you don't know your customer or you don't know your supply chain? which highlights the importance of innovative forms of monitoring during times of crisis when risks are indeed increasing. So thank you very much for that, um, that parallel. Um, we go on to uh, Pia Ure Trulsen, who is a CSR manager at the Norwegian Hospital Procurement Trust in Norway. So Pia, welcome very, and uh, can you hear us? Let's see. Pia, are you there? I can't hear Pia right now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. So I'm working for Norwegian Hospital Procurement. We are responsible for buying uh, all sort of things to all the public hospitals in Norway. And uh, I've been working with uh, ethical uh, supply chains during the last 10 years and have one goal that we will have ethical and transparent suppliers in, in all the tenders we do. But how can we do that? We, first of all, we need to have equal qualification or contract criteria, not only in Norway, but I believe we need it in the whole part of uh, Europe so we can stick together. We have to comply or our uh, suppliers need to comply with all the ILO core conventions within human and workers' rights. And we must ensure what some of my colleagues have said that uh, the supply chains should be transparent. Uh, we need as a public buyer to know where our products are coming from. Um, but I think the most important part is not setting criteria or uh, qualification demands if you're not following up your contracts. So I think we need to be better within public procurement to follow up our contracts also within uh, social criteria. So what would be the responsibility to our suppliers? they need to choose the good manufacturers. The manufacturers should know that they really have to uh, be fair to their workers if they should join a, a public contract. Um, we should also, they should be a partner, the supplier should be a partner to drive improvements. It's not about comply or die, it's more about making the world a better place tomorrow. Um, but I think we can ask our suppliers also to know what kind of issues are there around the world within the social uh, aspects. How are the workers' rights uh, in the world? And we need uh, our suppliers to be aware of these issues around uh, the world within the different categories. Mm. But how, how can our suppliers be transparent? We have been asking for a country of origin in all our products for the last eight years. And in the beginning, the suppliers will tell us it's, it's our business, it's not your business. But we need our suppliers to be transparent and tell us about the supply chains. They should also tell us about the non-conformities in the supply chain so we are aware. Maybe we can work together to find better solutions uh, for the manufacturers. Uh, what we need to do as public procurers, we have some responsibilities to set the demands and follow up. We need also to cooperate with our procurers uh, and we also have to be very, very clear to our suppliers what are our expectations. 
So they know what we want them to do and they should uh, do yeah, what we demand them to do, of course. Um, but we're also, when we are cooperating with our suppliers, it's very um, important that we will be strict and we will walk the talk if we say we will uh, end the contracts due to the fact they have not follow up on workers and the human rights. Um, we need to have the dialogue, not only with our suppliers, but I believe with suppliers or manufacturers all around the world. One within, minute, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, within the pandemic, we have been buying the PP, PPE products, and I think it shows that we have to know our supply chain, not only who we have on contract today, but who can we meet in contracts for tomorrow as well. And of course, we need to communicate uh, our findings and our, uh, yeah, what's going on in public medias as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pia, uh, for weaving together so many of the important themes of the presenters already here and doing it so uh, in, in, in such a concise way. Um, the, uh, I like the fact that you are st stressing the follow-up on the criteria that we set, um, that it is not about comply or die, but it's about making the world a better place. And uh, so keep your eye on the prize is an important bottom line message. And if you do that, then perhaps you can also encourage suppliers to be more transparent and even tell you about the non-conformances of the problems that they have. We're moving on now to the final presenter. So last but not least to Angus Warren, who is the CEO of Advanced Procurement for Universities and Colleges, APUC in Scotland in the UK. Angus, welcome and can you hear us? I can hear you, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Excellent, okay. Just, to, just for those who don't, aren't aware of us, what we are, we're the Centre of Procurement Expertise uh, and uh, Purchasing Authority for all of Scotland's universities and colleges. So we're here to sort of promote uh, best practice, uh, both policy and legal compliance, as well as operate as a consortia and work on collaborative procurement, uh, collaborative purchasing of uh, goods services uh, for the sector. I'm just, my subject today is to talk about using uh, technology to maximise transparency. Transparency is absolutely key thing. We we need to, in, to move the agenda forward for human rights within this, our supply chains and workers' rights. Uh, I think it's interesting actually that obviously we're dealing with electronics and the, I think the solution to us being able to manage this, the electronic supply chain is to use technology more than we do now uh, so that we can actually use it to hold a mirror up to the technology companies on what they're doing. I think uh, we, we've recently done some work with Electronics Watch uh, on mainstreaming or, or piloting social media scanning uh, using Global Works. I'm not sure, I won't, I won't have time to go into that today, but an organisation who scans social media to, to look for uh, indications of uh, workers' rights issues in the electronic supply chain. That's been incredibly useful and I think we need to move to a model where we, we use data gathered, especially when it's based on mass data, consistent mass data, uh, to, to address issues and bring issues to the supply market. The supply market will be reluctant. The supply market will not like anything that's going to increase transparency, especially transparency in a way that they can't control. And they obviously, social media, it's harder to keep a grip on than it is to, to issue through the RBA. So these technologies have huge potential, I think, to develop going forward. And there may be more than one uh, type of platform that we can use to do that. I think we can explore use, ex increasing use of whistleblower portals, although they, they do come with some challenges because it needs some very careful validation of these. They're open to, to, to mass uh, abuse also, but, but they also do have a place. And I think it's important that we, we, we have mechanisms to affect that in all public buying organizations. I think we, we could look at uh, more about uh, working with other NGOs in the human rights area, people like Amnesty International, because generally in countries where 
there are general human rights abuses, there's also workers' rights abuses. The two go hand in hand. If you have a very effective regime in a country to manage people's human rights, you also tend to have a very effective regime to manage a workers' rights. So, and uh, obviously the reverse is true. I think we should use technology to create a, a international database, starting off fairly simply, but on locations and building status and information on supply sites, supplier sites, sub-supplier sites, going down the supply chain, maybe creating a unique identifier for each one. Uh, as Kathleen said, that the, the electronic supply chains are very dynamic. But if we have something which has got a set of unique identifiers, it's much easier if we can sort of, if suppliers can then say, this is produced at like T5, G4 and M4 at level one, and then go down using uh, internationally recognized identifiers. I know there's companies like Dun & Bradstreet that do it, but you, you have to pay for that, that privilege. And it's not complete for, it's definitely not complete for the electronic supply chain. Uh, so something that where we can start to build that, I think is, is quite important. And I think it would be good if we're going to work seriously with RBA, I think it would be good for them to open their audit database to public buyers so that we've got the, the transparency of the information that they have. Uh, if they're genuinely uh, there to support and improve workers' rights, I think that they will support it. I'm not suggesting we make it as something that's absolutely public, but something that can be shared with public buyers uh, so that we, one, don't duplicate efforts so that we can work with them more in a genuine partnership with the supply market. Failing that, obviously, to, to work with individual uh, major brands uh, if, if one minute, please, answer. Angus. One minute. Thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. So, so I think going forward, I mean, what, what can we do to improve these these things at this time? So, I think, yeah, as I said at the very beginning, transparency through technology is key. Uh, we need to collectively invest, I think, in uh, transparency technology, so that we can maximise the value of the worker voice, uh, and, and that is easiest to obtain when we're using uh, technology platforms uh, that are widely used across the populations of the world. So that was really all for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angus, for um, taking the, the um, challenge of transparency one step forward to ask the critical question, well, how? How, uh, how to make it practical? And what are the sources of transparency? Drawing upon the, the information that we get from, from NGOs, human rights organizations, um, social media, and also from companies. So thank you very much for this, Angus. And um, with this, we're going on to the next phase of this, um, of this webinar. Uh, I want to first uh, thank all of the presenters for the fantastic, uh, insightful presentations of every single person for keeping within the five minute uh, limit. I don't think uh, it was even necessary for me to, re to give the uh, one minute warning, but uh, I started doing that, so I kept on doing that, so it would be equal for everybody. Thank you so much for everybody for this. So let's look at, um, what are some, some of the common themes here? And I think that you've heard them. Um, first of all, the goals uh, are ambitious, of course. Uh, it is to drive economic recovery and responsible business to ensure respect for the rights of workers, safe conditions, labor rights, environmental responsibility, and to do all that efficiently and with cost savings. So how do you, do, how do you get there? Um, the presenters stressed a number of shared objectives, some common themes, demand, transparency, collaboration. Demand, public procurement demand that is aligned across borders and that is sustainable, that is, go, that, that is dependable. Demand that can be innovative, that can drive change. And then transparency was a huge uh, theme, of course, of the presenters, as we have heard, that means transparency of supply chains, who, you know, where is the pro products coming from, where are they made? It also means transparency in terms of due diligence, what is the due, due diligence practices of the companies, and it means transparency of working conditions. Uh, to, to As far as having the companies report, here are the problems that I'm having, here are the uh, non-conformances non that we're having. And transparency, as we heard, also means transparency of companies, but also transparency of the public buyer. And finally, uh, the final objective here is collaboration. Uh, and we heard that collaboration really can work if it's collaboration among public buyers 
but also the importance of, uh, of collaboration between public buyers and uh, suppliers. Um, so other presenters then talked about the specific steps that we need uh, to take to, to build this kind of sustainable, innovative demand, this transparency and the collaboration. Uh, for example, uh, speakers stress the importance of dialogue on many levels to ensure a strong unified message to the market. Um, speakers talked about the co contractual obligations to drive transparency, to make it mandatory and to make it uniform that way. Um, we heard about um, technical solutions such as shared data platforms to make transparency practical. Um, and about, um, we, we have heard uh, public buyers talk about the importance of sharing experiences and, and perhaps putting forward their case studies to drive collaboration and knowledge sharing. And finally, uh, remembering that uh, due diligence and responsible purchasing is in fact a shared responsibility for public buyers and suppliers. And that recognition in itself can drive the collaboration between public buyers and suppliers so that we achieve our end goal here, which simply put is uh, making the world a better place. So putting this all together, perhaps we have here an outline of a theory of change. Um, so let's try to take these steps together to achieve the unified demand, the transparency and the collaboration to drive responsible business, protect worker rights, and ensure resilient supply chains. These are the, this concludes the presentation part and the wrap up part of the presentation. And now uh, I'm turning it over to Peter who will be um, uh, coordinating your questions and answers looking at the tinyurl.com slash eWatch 2021 site to see what you've put up there. Peter, over to you. Yes. Great, thank you, Bjorn. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, so you hear me all. Um, so if you if you have not yet uh, looked up, and probably all the presenters have not yet had the time, uh, if you go to tinyurl.com slash eWatch2021, you can see, um, and you probably see also my screen, you can see um, a lot of things have happened here actually. So I, we have 12 minutes left. We probably won't be able to go through all of these points, but I would like to first go on my ideas um, and then go to questions so we can actually um, um, think about, about having a Q&A. Um, so let's go first to my ideas. The, basically the ideas that uh, you brought forward, you, uh, how you think uh, public procurement should uh, think about developing. So the first one is doing the right thing and doing it in the right way. Uh, the right thing is best value for money, the right way, uh, not at the expense of people or workers or the environment, preserving human uh, labor and environmental rights. This got actually two upvotes. Uh, the next one was bring together social responsible public procurement with sustainable investment practices by public investors. For example, pension funds to strengthen the leverage in engagement with industry. This is something uh, we have not heard to, to today, but uh, uh, only in, in, in Kathleen's um, mentioning of the financial industry. Um, the next one uh, was the love, uh, love the thought of consequences on businesses that either lie or choose not to reply to independent evidence of serious violations. And we actually have a question also relating to this. So this will come up later again. Um, and the last idea that was uh, written down here on the board, and you can actually still write your uh, questions on the board or upvote uh, specific questions you like. So the last idea is use your leverage, leverage to support workers in supply chains to self-organize into genuine trade unions where possible. Um, Oh, now I skipped something. Um, uh, the spotlight you shine gives them a chance they did not have before. So this is actually something that Bjorn and I uh, and everybody at Electronics Watch are very, very often discussing that the best monitoring is, is actually not done by monitoring partners, but actually by, by workers themselves, what we actually use. Um, 
and having a strong labor unions in every factory of the world, we would be actually already knowing that a lot of things, a lot of positives, uh, positive things are happening. So all of these ideas are, I think, really great. We will be um, following up on them and we will be trying to, to integrate them also as, as the other 12 ideas into our future work. So let's skip the comments because uh, we have a lot of questions and comments you can obviously also just check out. Um, so I will try to ask some of the speakers uh, to answer to the questions. Um, I have organized them by upvote. So this one got actually six uh, pluses. So the question is, as we know, audits are deficient. Which alternative concepts could be used as proof of better practices in the realm of public procurement? And maybe Dimitri, as a, uh, as a monitor, could you maybe shed some brief light on what you think alternative concepts to social audits could be? Uh, I, I don't have sort of the, the golden answer on this, but let me share a thought. I think this is a moving target. Uh, there was a time when audits did not do worker interviews. They now, many of them in the electronics industry do worker interviews. Some of them do offsite interviews. There was a time when no one was doing worker hotlines. The industry has developed worker hotlines. When the industry tends to take on these ideas that are commonly brought up by civil society and workers' rights organizations, they tend to warp those methods and they no longer work the way they were originally envisioned. One of the things I think we could do to drive better monitoring beyond always maintaining and improving and investing in independent monitoring, monitoring by workers and workers' rights organizations and unions um, is to demand that the industry take responsibility for their monitoring. So when there are reports about serious violations, we should be getting responses from the industry that explain why they either think they resolved the problem or they th they deny that that problem exists. That needs to be a conversation that is pursued. That's a very limited conversation because the sites that are under investigation are few, but that would drive deeper consequences. Okay, so thanks for, for, for this um, uh, quite positive perspective on how it's actually changing to to the better step by step. It's obviously not as fast as we would like it to, to change, but there is a visible impact of the activities of uh, civil society organizations, as well as public buyers who, who demand actually uh, um, some proof of, ver of verification. We will have some questions on this too. The next question is, um, is to procurers and especially to, uh, uh, so it's really procurement perspective. So what we have seen is a lot of a discussion on collaboration. So the question is how important are procurement consortia? Um, should countries, regions that want to develop towards social responsible public procurement as a first step try to set up such uh, buying clubs? And how complex is this actually? Um, so um, Steve, you have been talking a bit about uh, how, you, how you build this up. Maybe you can give us a brief overview What's the strength besides, uh, besides uh, just cost issues and especially how complex is it? Sure, so there are a couple of things. Firstly, I, I would suggest uh, not waiting until you've got your consortia in place to, to implement these things. The, you know, the best time to implement modern slavery laws was 10 years ago and the second best time is now. Um, so, you know, let's get started straight away. Um, procurement, uh, collaborative procurement is not easy. Um, you do have to bring people together in a trusted environment um, and you have to have some very common objectives um, across the group. Um, typically, I found it grows out of existing collaborative groups. So whether there's existing discussion, existing shared work. Um, we've been doing it for a very, very long time since the early 1990s. Um, so, you know, we, we've had that advantage that the trust network is already built um, and you're leveraging that quite heavily to, um, to add on the requirement for not just cost saving, which is really simple to argue for, but to uh, implement corporate and social responsibility, which is, uh, can be more difficult depending on, especially if it then costs more. But I don't see it as zero sum game either. I don't think it necessarily needs to drive costs up. 
um, although you can choose to do that. So you could choose to pay more to get a better outcome. Um, in terms of where to start, I would start with a collaboration that you're already involved in, groups that you work with closely. Um, Cordit's not unique in this worldwide. There are groups that do university collaboration uh, in just about every region that I can think of. There's Giant in Europe, there's JISC and Usiza in the UK, there's a French uh, group as well. Um, they, they exist in every country that I've spoken to. Um, and we actually now are getting to the point where we have a group of groups. Uh, it's called CHITA, which is the Coalition of Higher Education IT Associations. It is the group of groups. And so, um, you know, we're starting to get significantly more advanced, but please don't let it stop you from working locally um, as a starting point. Thank you, Steve. That is, I think, quite a, quite a good on observation. Start and then develop for, further. So let's move mm. to the next question. Um, it is about the dialogue with ICT suppliers. What, uh, and this is um, a bit about the proofs we can ask to be sure that they are doing serious efforts to respect workers in COVID times. Um, and as uh, I would group it together with also the next question, basically asking what are possible questions to ask now in a dialogue. And I want to pro provide a first answer and then I, um, I, I, I will ask also one of our panelists. So one of the, one of the things that, that you can immediately do is after, after this webinar, you can go to the Electronics Watch website and you can download this document. This is publicly available to everybody. Um, this is basically a, um, a survey document that you can either send to your suppliers or um, uh, or use specific questions. And this is focusing on issues related to COVID-19. Um, so there is, uh, there is a section on occupational health and safety, as you see, there are questions on um, uh, further below, you have questions, uh, occupational health and health and safety, you have questions on where is it labor rights, you have questions on management system consideration. You have questions on environmental and community impacts uh, and also on safeguarding privacy. The, uh, the focus of this document is not policies. The focus is really asking questions about what are your actions as companies. So this is something you can start to, to today. You have the questions. Um, you can also download it in uh, Spanish. Uh, so if, if your organization is, is working in Spanish, you can go to, uh, to our site and uh, download it. But as I know that um, Kathleen, uh, the region of Stockholm uh, is really, really um, uh, good and, and developing very strongly um, a su supply chain uh, engagement and talking to your suppliers. Could you may maybe um, expand a bit on, on, um, on your experience of what are the proofs that you, can, that you are actually asking for? Uh, your supply chain to uh, to see what they are doing both in the time of crisis as well as beyond. With one minute left, um, I oh. think that we're, it's okay. It's good. Uh, I think that the questions are excellent. I think the challenge is in verifying that uh, this is actually happening on the ground. We've been in a conversation with a reseller who has increased prices because. Uh, the manufacturer has said that it's more costly for them now to have all of these uh, COVID uh, prevention measures in place to protect the workers. And when I asked our supplier, so, cause what happens is, you know, it gets more expensive, but who in the end ends up paying for this? Well, it's us. Uh, someone said, I think uh, the buyers bear the costs, the workers bear the loss. I was like, how are you verifying that they're actually doing this and they're not just increasing the prices and they didn't have an answer. They was sort of like, no, well, we, you know, we've asked them and they, this is their report with all the measures. They, they weren't even verifying uh, mm. because they were just passing on the costs to us. So I think there the contact with, you know, if, again, if you know your supply chain, you know what factory to ask about, uh, we basically need a human rights activist for every single factory in our supply chain or a monitoring partner. Cause right now that's the only way that we can um, mm. verify that that yes, there's a self-evaluation, there's what they say, but how do you know that they're actually doing this? And I think that's a, a big challenge for, 
for everyone, I don't have an answer to that except for getting information from, from the ground. Well, and this is actually a, a great last, uh, last thought because this brings us full circle to the discussion on transparency. We need transparency on basically every level. Um, to understand what what this uh, the supply chain is actually doing, and the supply chain with this within the supply chain actually also needs more transparency. So the uh, the various com companies also understand who is actually bearing the uh, the cost. So with this, we are um, we have uh, uh, touched upon many things. We have now. Uh, uh, reached one hour and 30 minutes. That was what, what we were planning for. So we won't be uh, um, stealing more time of you. Thank you for all the speakers for your great in insights you provided. Thank you for all commentators and all listeners for your ideas, for your comments, for your questions. Um, this uh, was one of our uh, webinars. There will be more. We will be planning or we are already planning a, um, a occupational health and safety summit in November, December. So go to our website if you want to, to learn more about that. Um, so um, just look out always on our website for more of these webinars and we'll be bringing you some more insights into this uh, very vast and vastly uh, moving field. Thank you. <laughs>